Today's session is the next steps of repository infrastructure, and we're really pleased to have um, our four panel members here today who are going to talk one after the other, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So first of all, we have Rachel Bruce, who's the Head of Open Research in UKRI, then George McGregor, the Assistant Director for Digital Libraries at the University of Glasgow, then Jenny Evans, who's the Research Environment and Scholarly Communications Lead at the University of Westminster, and then Sarah Thompson, the Assistant Director for Library Archives and Learning Services, University of York. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and um, thank you, Claire. So um, I have to admit, I've not been to an event discussing repositories for some time. So I'm going to come from um, perhaps a, a fairly policy driven um, perspective. Um, but just in, I suppose, that whole question um, that we are discussing today, so thinking about um, where next for repository infrastructure, um, I would just like to, um, I suppose, make the observation that we ask this question um, quite often and we've, we've been here um, before. So I suppose um, what makes it different this time um, are we going to really um, be able to address some of the issues that we highlight? And I think what makes it different this time is I do think um, there are a set of um, contexts which are really um, making repository infrastructure um, perhaps more recognised as part of the essential infrastructure underpinning research. And I will just point to some of the thoughts around that um, from um, emerging work and policy directions. So um, if we are thinking about um, where next for repository infrastructure, obviously within this context, what we are really thinking about is where next for research. Um, and um, no surprise here with me being the head of open research at UK Research um, and Innovation, um, I want to talk about them with regards to achieving that goal and aspiration of what might be called open science or open research. Um, I think increasingly, um, and we might say this every year, but I can tell you the amount of um, policy work, directions and investment in the area of open science um, is immense around the globe. Um, there are continual whatever um, research and innovation policy forum or discussion that is underway, there is always an element of open research as part of that. And you'll see that repeatedly in recommendations from high level multilaterals such as G20, G7, UNESCO, OECD um, and so forth. And that is because it is a shared um, ambition for us to have truly open and transparent research because of all of the benefits that we, of course, um, are, are probably all all very aware of. Um, and essentially, um, reaching that goal of open science is really about that huge digital shift within research um, and making sure that we're using digital to its full effect to improve the research system. So I think with that, it's probably um, when, when thinking about the future of repository infrastructure, it's helpful to look at the UNESCO open science recommendations as a sort of starting point or a framing. And so they really talk about um, the necessity um, and the ambition for open science, ensuring that research from all fields is accessible to everybody, and that being accessible to everybody in terms of the research environment, but also broader society. But they also go beyond that issue of accessibility um, and highlight, which of course is an emerging um, 
critical issue that knowledge production also needs to be inclusive, equitable and sustainable. And, and sustainable, I think, has um, many meanings. Um, perhaps key ones are around environmental sustainability, but also sustainability in terms of affordability. Um, and I think that, you know, essentially repository infrastructure has to be able to support these aspirations. And it doesn't mean that repository infrastructure solves all of those issues, but is part of um, that the delivery of the infrastructure that is required to meet those research ambitions. The other two key elements that come through in um, the UNESCO recommendation um, and I think are absolutely essential are, of course, thinking about the repository infrastructure in terms of how it can support collaborations, many different types of collaborations, and being really truly interconnected so that the research and innovation system is interconnected and the repository infrastructure needs to be interco interconnected itself, but to support um, those diverse networks. Then if we take um, the report from, if we want to come down to, I suppose, um, one lower level um, that underpins um, how the repository infrastructure might get there. Um, the survey work and report that Open Air, Libra and Spark Europe and Core undertook in 2023 is really helpful. That looks at the current state of digital repositories um, and what might be future directions. Um, and really what that shows is we've got you know, a rich repository infrastructure, um, but there are, of course, challenges that need to be um, addressed. Um, and the way in which that um, report categorises um, the three main, um, I suppose, areas of action that are required, um, and I would say I very much agree with these. I read this um, recently, um, but it really does um, align with the sorts of things that I have observed. So number one is maintaining up to date and functioning platforms. That is an issue and it is something that needs to be addressed. Um, also, um, more consistent. Practices um, across repositories and repositories being visible in the ecosystem. And I, I take that actually as visible in the ecosystem as part of the infrastructure and different services, but also, of course, visible to, um, I would say, both um, researchers um, and also research leaders and those that will invest in that infrastructure is important and that can actually um, also have ramifications in other levels such as um, even at a government level. So that particular report I think is really useful in, in um, focusing and I think it does align to where we look at the direction of um, research and if we again we've got that, that wide ambition about open um, science and open and transparent and collaborative research. But then what are the real opportunities within that um, closer term? And I think where we can really see that repositories do have an essential role, and I am increasingly seeing this in um, conversations um, across the globe in terms of how to meet um, the the open access challenge, challenge, let alone um, the broader open science challenge, is, of course, um, when we look at research articles and green um, open access and the support of things such as re rights retention strategies. We've got to make sure that repositories are really fit for purpose if we're going to really have a tool um, such as rights retention strategies and if that option um, for open access, which is equitable and more affordable and sustainable, um, is something that can be realised. And then again, within um, 
the European report I mentioned, they talk about this emergence towards um, new models around publish, curate, review. Um, and we are increasingly seeing an interest in that. And I, I don't think, you know, it's not a one size fits all, um, but those are two critical directions that um, need to be considered when thinking about um, the repository infrastructure. Um, another opportunity, um, as well as those that um, I think really needs to embraced, em, be embraced is the one that, again, I'm increasingly seeing a real um, commitment and belief that we need to have um, an open infrastructure that is community owned. Um, and so some things that indicate um, and that are aligned with that are things such as, you know, the Barcelona Declaration talking about open research information and repositories, um, I think, need to really take some of those issues quite seriously and um, address them in terms of their um, the, the roadmap forward. Um, but with all of that, there are, of course, those really, um, really challenging issues that we also have and that you need to be um, aware of. So I've used the word sustainability, but we really do have issues around um, finances um, within the research system. Um, and some of those can be at a very local level, as well as at um, a national or global level. Uh, those really need to be um, considered. And then we have issues around um, climate concerns. So increasingly making sure infrastructure actually delivers and, and delivers on net zero commitments. Um, and of course, security concerns. Um, so the... Um, the change that we're seeing in our, um, I suppose, global, political, geopolitical um, system, those issues also um, need to be addressed. Um, and then I, I think really where we are is we've got this now, which is really a huge, rich um, infrastructure expertise, um, and then this future and how do we navigate between those those two things? Um, speaking about immediate sort of quick wins and, and some of the the issues that um, that European report highlighted, we've also been undertaking work if we just looking at how to meet um, or more effectively meet some of the um, requirements set out in the UKRI open access policy. And it is incredible um, how difficult it can be to navigate some of the issues around metadata and ensuring that repositories support good metadata, but also ensuring that um, the wider ecosystem does. So I think there are aspects that we need to um, address there in the immediate term. Um, but there is something around really, um, really taking advantage of the opportunity around um, green open access and rights retention strategies. Look at the, the Japanese model as well. Um, in terms of supporting um, a policy around um, green first, whilst we have a more mixed environment, um, which I think is, you know, the, dire the direction of travel, um, it really does have a role and for it to have a role, um, repositories need to um, help address that. Um, and I, I so I think really for me, um, there are, two real things that the repository community within the UK and more, more broadly, of course, but within the UK, um, as I'm speaking today, need to look at. And I do think that um, collaboration, and by that I mean real collaboration, so I think being prepared to make some hard decisions um, and to really collaborate together, um, and also... Um, the strategic case. The strategic case is extremely important um, and making sure that the role of repositories and the infrastructure within um, the 
uh, strategic direction of research and innovation um, needs to be better articulated and the collaboration across the community to meet that needs to be enacted in a way that it can effectively engage, um, address those issues and work with other partners. And I think that that also does mean being heard by research funders um, such as UKRI, other research funders, but also, of course, there are other actors and working um, with um, other sectors. Um, and finally, because I haven't really mentioned it, but it's been on my mind a lot lately, um, really, I, I, I worry sometimes that we are walking into a bit of a nightmare um, and we really, really need to address preservation um, and make sure that we really are talking about longevity of these outputs. Um, and I could see from the 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 report from um, the, the European partners that whilst that is thought about um, and in some places there's um, there's deeper um, I suppose consideration and addressing of those issues I don't think that is holistically addressed and I think it really needs to be thank you thank you Rachel that's really thought provoking um, now I want to pass on to George McGregor Okay, hi there. Thank, uh, thanks, Claire, and and thanks, Rachel. I mean, I'll I'll probably pick up on quite a few things that uh, Rachel mentioned uh, around visibility, uh, transparency, and interconnections, because that's principally the focus of what I'll be talking about for five minutes. But before I do that, I think it's worth just diving into this diagram. So this <clears throat> this is just a diagram of. The services that enlighten that's the universe one of the university of glasgow repositories interacts with because the good news is that repositories if it's a decent repository and of course not all repositories are are created equal but in general that they can be quite good at interoperating with a lot of the services that we might want our repositories to interact with so the likes of google scholar core uh, and so on. But I, I highlight this diagram because with some of these services, it, we're actually dealing with a bit of a moving target. There's always things to be done to ensure that repositories are better interoperating, particularly with aggregators like Core and Base. And certainly, you know, there are opportunities for repositories to participate in the PubMed link out initiative. Many institutions have, you know, rich medical collections in their repositories, but they don't share them uh, with that particular initiative. So I guess I'm just highlighting this as a way of saying, well, you know, we're here to ostensibly discuss next steps, but we also have to remember that we've actually not completed any of our previous steps. Um, there are many institutions that haven't optimized their OAI PMH endpoints and don't serve particularly interoperable metadata and uh, a, a two-minute conversation with Peter North from Core uh, will confirm that. Uh, it's astonishing to think that really most institutions are still serving their data over OAI uh, Dublin Core, and we'll return to that particular matter in a, in a few slides' time. But we, as, as a community, just have to spend greater attention uh, examining the inclusion requirements of all the services that we want to participate with. And I think uh, this isn't something that's given due consideration by a lot of institutions, because as Rachel kind of alluded to, uh, maintenance of repositories is probably not what it should be in a lot of cases. So institutions set up repositories uh, and then just leave them to sort of fester and don't maintain them. And really, we're dealing with moving targets here. We always have to be maintaining uh, repository infrastructures you know, to ensure that optimum interoperability with services. And likewise, we have to be thinking about uh, the design of our systems, uh, things like mobile first, uh, responsive repositories. You know, you don't have to go too far into repository land and you will encounter a repository that basically looks as it did 15 years ago. And these kind of things like uh, responsive user experiences, repository speed, the volume of digital content you have in your repository, all of that has a bearing on the discoverability of your content. And there's clearly things that as a community we can be doing better in that regard. And I would actually just make a plug for a workshop that was held at 
open repositories this year, which speaks more about uh, what I've just mentioned. Uh, and you can access all the slides uh, from Z uh, Zenodo there. But in terms of next steps, I mean, the, the obvious one is really just being better at modeling research outputs. We're now at a point where research outputs are quite complicated. And Rachel referenced the idea of inter interconnections as being central to open research. And that is really where repositories are well placed to, to deliver added value. We can be better at modeling research outputs and their relations. And you know, it is not unusual for us now to have a manuscript, for example, that links out to a an environmental data set, perhaps a preprint, related software, simulation software, maybe even uh, a detailed methodology published on Octopus. And, you know, creating those connections between those items is relevant for the wider scholarly graph, but it's also useful to humans and machines and aids discovery and so on. But it also just better characterizes modern outputs and Jenny will probably say quite a lot about practice based outputs. So this isn't actually a new problem, but I think it's a bit newer in the STEM side of, uh, of, of, of our domain because we are now starting to link up research data and software and so on. Uh, and of course, we can do that much more easily now with, uh, you know, linking entities using URIs. So that might typically be persistent identifiers and that gives us those interconnections. I suppose all of this though does feed into the concept of transparency that uh, Rachel mentioned. You know, if you, if institutions set up a repository, whoops, if institutions set up a repository, they're really in it for the long haul and you have to be interested in maintaining that content because as soon as you publish it, someone may be citing it in the literature. So the onus is on the repository to make sure that that content is uh, verifiable in the long term and that and that could be in decades to come so it does involve persistence and linking so persistent identifiers have a role to play here but actually the bigger role to be played is by organizations and accepting that they have to be maintaining this content and have a commitment to maintain it over time and that does include digital preservation because that is part of maintaining the scholarly record. And I suppose the final thing to say on this slide, and this is kind of related to the interconnections of the scholarly graph, it also helps discovery of research content. You can never really predict how users are gonna discover content and how machines are gonna consume uh, metadata. Uh, but if you have rich metadata that plugs into the scholarly graph, then there are greater routes for that content to be discovered. So I mentioned machines and we should always spare a thought for the machines because OAI Dublin Core really isn't satisfactory for describing our scholarly resources. And actually many people would say that it actually wasn't in 2002. And I'm old, showing my age perhaps, I'm old enough to remember when OAI PMH was first emerging and everyone said that OAI Dublin Core was inadequate for describing digital objects. And of course they were right. The expectation was that everyone would implement something far richer, but of course what we've been left with is repositories that tend to default to Dublin Core. And uh, Dublin Core just isn't very good at describing research outputs. And in particular, uh, it's not very good at, in general, there are things we can do, but in general, not very good at describing where the, the digital object or the file content is contained, and this is a perennial issue that aggregation engines and harvesters have to contend with. Uh, of course, uh, there are metadata schema out there that can help uh, model, you know, these research outputs and that content in a much more meaningful way for machines. But then there are also initiatives like signposting. So this is definitely something that we should be considering as a next step because uh, adoption of signposting is not as widespread as we would like at the moment. And really signposting feeds into what I've already said about REOX and being bad at pointing to full text content because signposting is a recognition that although institutions beaver away on metadata, 
and think that it somehow connects to the digital object in the repository, very often that's not the case. Unless you're a human, you'll never find that full text content. So we need machine protocols to help software agents know where the full text content actually is. And there are other next steps. You know, we should all be examining the adoption of FairyCat. It's a very low barrier way of uh, ensuring that repositories are upfront to machines about the discovery affordances uh, they support. I'm aware of time, so I'm going to skip in inaccessibility, except to say we have to make our full text content in particular accessible to humans and machines, particularly visually impaired users. But then a final one is on Gen AI and repositories relationship with large language models. This year, there's been quite a lot of discussion about uh, the way in which large language models are crawling repositories. They tend to be very aggressive in how they crawl repositories. They're very high in number as well, and that's affecting how services are delivered. And there was a really interesting paper at Open Repositories by Diego Pino Navarro that really, I think, I'm really just plagiarizing what he said actually, but here by saying, you know, that we need to talk about uh, how we engage with these kind of systems because we don't want to be in the business business of closing our content uh, to these kind of services because AI and good quality information on which large, large language models can be trained can only come from services like repositories. And so there is a need for repositories and large language models uh, to work together in order to solve uh, scientific challenges, but also to improve the discovery of research. So I, I probably said enough. So I think I'm handing over to Jenny now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Okay. Six minutes. Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. I've tried to keep things as, as uh, streamlined as I possibly can. So where am I starting today is this idea and concept of other uh, and in particular non-traditional research outputs. Uh, if that's working, great, that seems to be working. Uh, so non-traditional research outputs don't easily fit into current research reward and recognition systems. Uh, and as a consequence, the current repositories and open standards landscape have limitations. So I don't think we can say that it doesn't represent this research well uh, or at all, but it doesn't do it well. So there's a lot of assumptions based on scientific uh, publishing, which we know has been in place for a long time, uh, focuses on the idea of end products, uh, and potentially now that idea of data sets underpinning that end product, uh, non-traditional research outputs, as they're often known, uh, are considered an add-on. Uh, they're treated individually, often around formats rather than respecting the research. Uh, and if we think about uh, other features, range of files, types of repositories they sit in, uh, the need for, for this idea of reflecting research uh, context and narrative in that process. Uh, and process is often as important as products. Uh, so all I'm going to say about practice research and some definitions is really that what practice research does is it moves us beyond thinking about these outputs as, as an add-on, as other. Uh, I think the other really important point to note, having engaged with these discipline communities directly, is that the reason practice research is so important is that there are different flavours. This is continuum of practice research, practice-based, practice-led, practice-informed, artistic practice, artistic research. And so, so this idea of practice research that's really been solidified by uh, the Bully and Sahin reports, the Prague reports, uh, is really important because it brings our discipline, a huge range of disparate disciplines together. Uh, and so we get beyond that kind of idea of what is. And that idea of narrative is really important. So in scientific publishing, the context is spelled out in the journal article. Uh, in practice research disciplines, it's not necessarily so straightforward. Or well, having been at uh, the Daria EU conference a few months ago uh, and listening to an presentation of a researcher who wrote an entire book to document her database, uh, I think uh, there are opportunities uh, to make this easier. So from that institutional context um, perspective, uh, we used our repository to innovate at the University of Westminster uh, and looked at and had and built one repository for all outputs. So not separating publications and data sets, which I think is a real problem uh, in this space. Uh, we built this repository in co-design with our art and design and architecture practice research community. So that idea of working uh, in co-design with community, uh, really important. It was library and archive services led. 
uh, and it brought together all of this expertise. And I think this has been sort of highlighted by previous speakers already today, Rachel and George, but, but the expertise and its infrastructure, its repository, its open access, research data, metadata, persistent identifiers and repository developers. There's a huge number of experts. Uh, at Westminster, our institution and policy environment uh, is very inclusive and it acknowledges that diverse range of outputs. So we don't expect all of our practice research to be completely open access, but we encourage our community and we enable it. Uh, also acknowledge that need to build knowledge across our research community and things like copyright guidance and some academic engagement librarian capacity. We had identified at this point um, the issues with the open standards landscape. And I think like this presentation is as much about uh, open standards as it is repositories. Uh, we were able to scale this up thanks to some AHRC funding uh, and look at how what we've done at Westminster scaled up. Because I think this is a real challenge uh, in this space is, is capacity and actually all of like every institution in the country that has practice research going on has done something to their local repository uh, or CRIS system to make it better fit. But, but actually what we need is to build standards, but we need to do this in collaboration uh, with our discipline communities. So that's the kind of spoken uh, add-in for NITEM and other uh, events about the practice research work uh, we've done, and you can read more about that offline. Uh, we certainly collaborated with the Sparkle team uh, led by the University of Leeds, and thank you to AHRC for our funding. So a couple of key priorities I just wanted to quickly highlight from this work uh, is this idea of expanding existing open standards. So as I sort of said right at the beginning, all of the open standards aren't terrible, they just don't fit very well at the moment. So what we've been able to do is document that work we started in our repository at Westminster. This concept of portfolio goes beyond collection. So portfolio and collection are different. Uh, and really looking at artifacts and events becoming equal to literature and data sets. I think that's really important uh, and, and some amazing work uh, done in collaboration with the team at CoSector to help illustrate this. Incorporating that range of contributors, creators, collaborators, participants. A lot of this has come out of our research. Uh, and I think just to remind us all that open standards are underpinned by transparent governance, and that's really important to remember. So we finally have a schema uh, that we'll, uh, we'll be sharing later in the year. That therefore enables this time saving for all researchers in all disciplines. And I think for me, what's really important about this piece is how do I sell ORCID to an arts and humanities researcher who has to manually add all of their metadata into a template uh, that doesn't actually reflect the fact that there might not be a publisher, for example, uh, and how many contributors were involved, curators, uh, composers, all of those additional uh, contributors. So I think the other priority that's come out of this work and to remind us all is the people. There are so many communities. This is just the PR Voices community of practice. I think what's really important is going out to those discipline communities. Uh, I was speaking at the Royal Musical Association a couple of weeks ago and and really like talking to, to discipline communities and, and being that translator, we can't expect, uh, speaking in with our colleagues at PIDFest earlier in the year, we can't expect our researchers to get to grips with all of the detail here. That That's why we have experts uh, in these communities, in repositories, in open standards, uh, uh, in research data. It's just the challenges these conversations are having in multiple places uh, and so how we kind of bring them all together and they do need to be global and, and that's the other thing this these communities are global this isn't something we can just work on in the uk so uh, the most important bits uh, very briefly to finish uh, so opportunities and challenges for repositories and open standards i, I don't think you can have one without the other uh, or if you do uh, you lose some of those interoperability benefits that we've spoken about already so really transforming the capture and presentation of practice research, uh, shifting from retrospective capture of end product to proactive ongoing capture. So capturing process when it's happening, presenting this research in meaningful ways and reflecting that context and enabling excellent user experience through interface design. Recognizing and respecting the range of contributors. So from the PR Voices project, particularly creators, collaborators and participants, but also open infrastructure expertise. And I think that is something we need to recognise more uh, practically. I know there's a lot of work going on around the technicians commi uh, commitment and, and technicians, but, you know, what what's the equivalent or how do we we raise the profile of this expertise and reward it? Ensuring open standards underpin all work, uh, ongoing community engagement, co-design, uh, that skills and training piece. However, there are a pile of challenges. Uh, uh, already referenced uh, by both Rachel and George, that balance uh, between structure and flexibility, the maintaining capacity in a sustainable way, 
uh, increasing representation of repository infrastructure experts in open infrastructure governance mechanisms, which really are uh, sort of like um, there's a lot of publishing experts uh, and I am responsible for our university open access press. Uh, so I, I am aware of that space. Many stakeholders. How do we enable future innovation? But how do we influence? We can influence global research reward and recognition systems. Uh, fair data and research doesn't necessarily mean it's all open. And I take on board the open science being open in terms of definition. Um, but if you talk to researchers, uh, open. if you start talking about fair data, uh, and fair research, they're much more amenable uh, to having a conversation. Uh, funding policy landscape is challenging because not all practice research is actually funded directly. Uh, and uh, re respecting that provenance, the sort of ethics of, of, of participant data, uh, digital preservation has been, been referenced already. It's a huge, uh, huge challenge. Uh, and not just assuming that what works for text-based publications will work for, uh, for non-text outputs. Benefits, however, that increased discoverability, citation, preservation, interoperability, and reproducibility, the recognition of contributors, uh, but really that perception of value in that research reward and recognition uh, landscape, uh, and really widening the evidence base. This research is missing at the moment. And, you know, I came to this uh, moving from Imperial to Middlesex and, and having to do this mini ref exercise, and none of our arts and humanities data was reflected in the repository but actually doing it in a way that respects uh, the contributions uh, and then saving these researchers time. Uh, fair, open where possible research, uh, respecting those communities and contexts uh, and recognition of all disciplines and having a more inclusive, transparent research environment and helping to shape a positive research culture. And that's gonna you know, very briefly mention REF and that really is where REF I think brings some benefits uh, going forward. This people, culture and environment piece is actually really recognizing uh, the value uh, of this and I think that's it for me so I'm going to stop there and hand back to Claire thank I you think. Jenny now I'm going to hand over to Sarah I'm going to change tack a little bit um uh, following on from Jenny and George and I'm going to pick on upon some of the points um that Rachel mentioned about uh, open access to research articles so what I wanted to do first was talk about just a, a little bit about our White Rose um, research repositories, just to give some context to um, the situation we're in at my university, the University of York. Um, so we were fortunate enough to have a collaboration between um, three universities, Leeds, York and Sheffield. Our White Rose repositories um, give us the only actually consortial institution repositories in the UK um, and we've had them for 20 years now, which is incredible to think about. They're based on e-prints um, and always have been. We have two repositories, White Rose Research Online, which is for research outputs, uh, mainly articles, also books, book chapters, et cetera, et cetera. And we also have a thesis repository for doctoral level theses. Um, we have... Um, a system that feeds articles through to the uh, to White Rose Research Online from our CRIS systems at each of the three institutions. So two of us have symplectic systems. Um, at York, we have Pure. Um, and these are uploaded to eThesis Online via a manual deposit process. Having the three repositories gives us um, a great spread of different sorts of outputs, but it also gives us volume, which is fantastic. So just some quick figures there. And really importantly, I think for my University of York, which is the smallest of the three, it really allows us to punch above our weight. Um, we are one of the most heavily used institutional repositories in the UK, um, both um, the number of items on, on downloads. So that's just a little bit of background as to um, why repositories are important to us at York. And I'm now going to say a little bit about what we're doing next um, to capitalise more on our repositories and why. So, so as I've said, we've relied on our um, repositories for 20 years now, and they've been essential infrastructure for us. But we probably haven't appreciated them enough. Um, and the recent focus on rights retention and immediate green has raised their profile for us. Uh, also, new financial challenges have increased their importance. At York, we're going to be placing more reliance on uh, White Rose Research Online to make our authors 
um, journal articles open access and would also be placing more reliance on other repositories to enable our users to read open access content. And this is because um, we're facing um, quite big um, financial challenges um, and we have less money to spend on content. So very briefly, the University of York um, was one of the UK institutions which reported an operating deficit last year. Um, this has led to the university taking serious and significant measures to put itself on a sound financial footing for the future. And it's acting early and decisively. Um, one of the measures being taken is to make significant long-term reductions to all large operating budgets across the university for 2024, 25 onwards, so from now onwards. Um, and this includes the library um, and most, more specifically, the library's content budget. So what is this going to mean for us? Well, it me at the moment we're incredibly privileged at York. You know, we've we've had large publisher agreements, all inclusive offers um, for many years. We have read and publish agreements with all the main publishers, and lots of smaller ones as well. So what we're going to be doing is we ha we have no choice. We um, to meet the savings required, we have to step away from our largest read and publish agreements. So with the largest five publishers, so that's Elsevier, Springer Nature, um, Taylor and Francis, um, Wiley and Sage. We'll be replacing those with smaller bespoke packages um, or individual journal subscriptions. And we'll be mitigating against the loss of read access um, through a number of routes. So we'll have post cancellation access, um, for example, but we'll also be relying um, on improved links to open access articles, including those in repositories um, and on document delivery. And on the publishing side, we'll be relying more on our institutional rights retention policy and therefore our repository to meet open access publishing requirements. Um, we'll, we will as well be maintaining our institutional fund APCs in fully open access journals. So we're taking a very pragmatic approach. Um, we're saying we can't afford to um, subsidize hybrid publishing anymore. It's either going to be subscriptions um, or it's going to be um, fully gold open access. And in between, we'll be supporting a number of um, diamond initiatives, um, reconfirming our commitment to green infrastructure, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so moving forward, uh, we're also thinking about how um, we can continue to make use of um, the block grant we have from UKRI, um, which supports open access. So we currently use, use some of that grant to subsidize our read and publish agreements. Um, we won't be ne needing to do that anymore. So we're thinking about how, how can we use this to invest more in other flavors of open access publishing journals? What does that mean for our green infrastructure? So for example, we may consider um, uh, having more staff resource um, supporting our repository at York. So, for example, this might mean that we do more to contact authors to request them, their manuscripts if not everybody deposits them into Pure, for example. Or we, we could do more to check articles for data access statements, which are required under UKRI's policy. Um, we could do a lot more um, uh, promotion of this, um, but also to make connections between entities. So, um, you know, the, the things around... Um, what other aspects of uh, research data or code or things can be linked back to the article. So can we do more work around that in order to provide some added value for our repositories? Um, and we also intend to encourage more adoption, adaptation and creation of open educational resources as an alternative to expensive digital textbooks. Um, we have no infrastructure or policies to support this currently at York. So we'll need to develop these. And this is an area that in, in early stages of discussion with, with um, others in the White Rose Library Consortium. So this will all result um, in us continuing to have a di diverse portfolio of content. We'll be continuing to support a mix of publishers, large and small, continuing to support with even more emphasis our green infrastructure, um, and protecting and growing our spend on non-APC and BPC-based models at the expense of paywalled content. 
Um, so in summary, we're focusing on what we can do um, and referring back to our strategic roadmap to guide us. So just very quickly, um, we can avoid funneling all our re remaining budget to an ever smaller group of publishers. Um, secondly, we can try to positively influence the research and publishing landscape by increasing use of open access materials and open educational resources at York. And thirdly, we can use the current situation as an opportunity to reinvent the way we spend our collections budget in a way that supports York's mission to be a university for public good. So we committed to open research as an institution and our library strategy is to gradually shift the balance of spend from paywalled content to open content. And more specifically, to support the more affordable, sustainable um, and equitable models um, in scholarly publishing. So thank you, I'll stop there and, and we can go to questions. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to all our panelists. And it's great to see this list of questions I had for you all. Most of them have been answered throughout um, the discussions that we've had. So that's been really good to see. So I'm going to go to one um, that's coming in through the Q&A, um, if you can all come back on screen. And this is around collaboration. And I know, Sarah, that you and I um, are fortunate to be working through White Rose, so we have collaboration between our three institutions. But that is quite unusual um, in the UK, and as you said, the only one. Um, so I suppose it'd be interesting for others to sort of talk about areas for collaboration and how we think we can do that. And also potentially for Rachel about how UK and I can help us to form these collaborations, because obviously it's a bit of a leap into the dark sometimes working with others and how we do that. So, um, yeah, George, can I talk to you first? You've recently moved institution as well, so it'd be good to hear your thoughts. I just need to swallow a oh, extra sorry. strong mint. <laughs> um, so, I mean, uh, I suppose it you know it depends on on the collaboration, but I think I think you're kind of alluding to sharing repository infrastructure, like yeah. like White Rose, and so you know the White White Rose repository is a unique example of collaboration because it has been tried. So this this is the only thing I, I was I think I think it is a good thing, and it probably should be considered in some institutional circumstances for all the reasons we've described, particularly around maintenance and so on and uh, remaining relevant to adjacent uh, scholarly systems. And in fact, before Torsten Reimer moved to Chicago, I remember he presented a, a paper at an event and in it he was basically making the case for a, cooper a cooperative repository infrastructure because he was recognizing that there were a lot of repositories that were falling behind. However, uh, I am aware of two projects, and it is a while ago, that did attempt to set up Scottish uh, cooperative repositories and they failed because ultimately, um, you know, th there are always institutions that have particular interests and those interests don't align with the cooperative. So it is a very... Uh, it's, it's, it's a path that's well trodden and uh, it quite often leads to a swamp, a crocodile filled swamp. Um, so, yeah. So I don't really know if that provides any decent advice. I think it is it's probably one for institutions to consider where they where they do have legitimate problems in maintaining the repositories and where they can't be committed to maintaining that content over time, then I think there's definitely a case for looking for like-minded institutions and perhaps collaborating uh, and pooling resources. And, you know, I guess the folks at White Rose would be, you know, excellent people to speak to in order to make that kind of thing a success. And I think that goes back to what Rachel talked about, about the strategic case, that often when you've got things that are running and have been running for, what, 20 years, you forget about the need to sort of raise that profile in the strategic case. So I wonder, Rachel, if you can talk a bit about that, about ways that we can in the library to make the strategic case for our repositories and then the investment that they need to be collaborative and interoperability and resilient and preservation in particular. Yeah, I mean, I, su I suppose, you know, my observations, as I say, are, are really uh, from afar, um, so I I am not fully aware of 
um, the way in which the library community or the repository community is working within the UK in, in detail now. But my sense is that um, if, if, for instance, I get questions about, um, oh, shouldn't we just have a shared repository, right? So I will get that from someone in government um and they'll say oh look at look at what x is doing over here um and so so actually there's also just not much recognition of the fact that you know and i have to sort of say well we've actually got this amazing repository infrastructure and we've got these amazing people and actually you know blah 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 go back to ePrints and explain all of these things. So anyway, I, I think that there really needs to be um, a real thought around what repositories are there for, what they deliver for, and put it within the, um, the strategic context of the UK's research environment. Um, and that... You know, of course, there are all those issues that George mentioned. There's short-term decisions and things that need to be made, and there's there's political um, issues that you run up against. But um, I think without thinking about those things, the potential role of repository infrastructure and the communities around it will not get the backing, will not get the money, will not be recognised. But that is, do not see repository infrastructure and the repository expertise as an isolated set of issues. They are issues that need to be integral to um, the infrastructure. So I would suggest, for example, um, there should be much much more of a discussion around the digital research infrastructure within the UK. Where are where are the this this where is this part of the repository infrastructure in that discussion? It's not there. Um, and um, it is a bit. I know Jenny actually some of the funding that she'd be having from HRC is sort of there, but um, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm kind of waffling, but no, um, I think that's really useful for us, and we we often hide our lights behind a bushel in the library world, not shouting about what we do and how integral it is to the wider open research and sharing, and also the publisher deals and the sustainability of those, as Sarah talked about as well. So Jenny, can I bring you in to talk a bit more about collaboration with researchers? Because that's a lot of what's been happening with the PR Voices um, project as well. Yes, and, and, and I, I think um, what I, I, or I say I, we uh, across uh, both PR Voices and Sparkle, I think have found is, is the real benefit in collaborating because actually, number one, it's forced me as, as an infrastructure person to really rein in my detail level of detail. Uh, and actually, I would say that for all of these communities and funders particularly, is that in the repositories world, we're very good at detail. But the reality is, is that the funders don't want to know. Like, I, and I can see Rachel nodding, like it's pointless trying to tell uh, funders and, and government the minutiae of what's going on. We need to get key messages, think about. And I certainly for me working with researchers and actually having just come out of four years in the research and knowledge exchange office here at Westminster is thinking about the impact and and what are the problems uh, that the funders are trying to solve. I think and you know going to our researchers, what are the problems that they're having? Uh, and certainly for the mu mus musicians a couple of weeks ago, it's like, you know, how there's I can't find anywhere to put my stuff. Um, and, and I, and, you know, my stuff is, you know, it's, it's nonlinear. It, I want to make connections. My practice isn't recognized. So, so like listening, but also being a bit of a filter as well, I think, because we, we in the middle have the expertise and can do that translation piece. Our researchers shouldn't need to, and actually our funders shouldn't need to either. Um, so I think, you know, going back to the previous points, like really having better kind of articulation that actually connects to, to national strategy uh, and and doing that in a way that addresses the problems of those various communities um, and just uh, and finding and actually we've just been really lucky we found some amazingly engaged researchers who 
who were interested, but even them, you know, trying to suggest that one of them join the ORCID board, for example, that's almost a step too far. So it's 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 recognizing the expertise in this community and 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 raising awareness, you know, and that's down to you know job descriptions and and all of those things. Um so the but the collaborative piece, one more thing there is I mean, it's really interesting. Like, I'm really appreciating being invited to speak here today, but working in a post-92, I don't kind of fit in the RLUK ecosystem or necessarily. And so there is a real kind of barrier, I think, for um, different types of institution um, and, and whether or not they've got good representation. And, and what I'm really lucky for in terms of this practice research piece is it's a shared goal and, and mission almost for a variety of different people. Um, and also just remembering it's not always universities, I guess it's it's individual researchers, it's independent research organizations, it's, you know, it's just thinking a bit beyond kind of ref um, as well. Yeah, I'm now going to ask Sarah the last question and then I'm going to call us to a close. So thank you, everybody, for staying with us. Sarah, with what you were talking about, about the increased use of rights retention and, and other people's open access material as well from outside York, do you see that as an opportunity to raise the profile as the White Rose repositories and how are there any particular changes, I suppose, that you think you need beyond staffing with the repositories to enable this to happen? Yeah, I, th I think we do need to talk about our repositories much more. They've been very much in the background um, and they've almost been a kind of fallback, certainly when it comes to articles and access for articles. They're typically deprioritized below um, other access routes to the publisher website, for example. Um, so we, you know, we've been making more of um, tools uh, um, like browser plugins and uh, really encouraging people to, so, and doing a lot more promotion and articulation around the, the need to use those tools. Um, so see, so I, th I think it needs, just needs to be part of a broader conversation that we really want to have with our academics, um, which is not just around how they're accessing material, but actually around their publishing choices as well, um, and be much clearer with them about, you know, we're having, we're having to take some radical decisions here at York. Um, and being able to articulate why that is um, and why some publishers are ones that are better aligned to our university strategic goals than others um, and why therefore we are, if you like, almost protecting some smaller independent publishers um, and focusing our savings in other areas. I think it's, it's a very complex landscape, but we do need to get much better at articulating where we see um, um, as ourselves needing to go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, William and I are really pleased to see so many people here, and thanks to our panellists, and we'll see how we can pick things up. Rachel, is that yeah. a hand? I can I see. I think what Sarah said, you know, I, I really agree with that, and I think there are two things that, that would really, really help in raising the profile as opposed to other systems. Make it really clear that repositories get good Google juice. They ensure things are discoverable. People always think repositories don't do that and really do try and address that digital preservation issue. Um, and I think, you know, that that those are two things which um, if, if those are clearly addressed, people will see the value of that infrastructure for scholarship.